a whole bunch of stragglers. The residents aren't here and pharmacy's not here, but due to uh, it already being 8 o'clock. Um, today, I'd like to, I guess, formally welcome Dr. Colleen Jay to, the, to our transplant community. Um, as many of you are now aware, Dr. J is our newest uh, staff member on the transplant, in the transplant center. She's a uh, multi-organ transplant surgeon trained at the Mayo Clinic. Um, one day we'll actually do clinical work here, but she tells me her license is finally, I don't know if this is uh, <laughs> news you want to publicize yet, but her uh, license has finally been accepted in the state of Texas. So everyone. Um, <laughs> So she spent uh, two years at the Mayo Clinic. Two, yeah, two years. You'd think I'd know all this. I went over her CV so, uh, with a, a fine-tooth comb when we were trying to hire her. Um, general surgery at uh, Northwestern in Chicago and uh, undergraduate um, in Indiana. She is not a Texan. I think her trip here was her first trip to Texas. Um, oh, but uh, I, she's already talking about wanting to... Uh, obtain livestock and goats, so um, someone, at my own, someone at my own heart, though, I got rid of my goats. Um, so today, what, what was that? No heckling from the audience, please. Um, as you see, the title uh, of her talk uh, in regards to DCD liver transplantation, I'll just let her go ahead and get started. Thanks so much. Uh, so I won't introduce myself since he already did so much better a job of introducing me. I don't actually own a gun yet, so I'm probably officially not a Texan at all. Um, but as said, we're going to talk about donation after cardiac death or DCD liver transplantation, which has long been a pet project for mine, at least a pet research project. And what we're going to talk about is how to improve um, decision making through a business model called best practices benchmarking. So I found that when we talk about DCD liver transplantation, I don't know if there's any way to shrink the slides, something's the tops at the bottom, but if not, we'll just persevere. Um, I found it very useful to go ahead and define it because I find even amongst transplant audiences, not everybody knows what we're talking about. So DCD or donation after cardiac death donors are actually the minority of the deceased donors we use in this country currently. Most donors come from brain death donors whose hearts and lungs continue to pump blood to the organs until they're actually ready to be flushed. Different from these, DCD donors have also undergone a serious neurological injury, but they don't meet those very strict criteria for brain death. So in these situations, after the family's decided to withdraw support, care can be withdrawn, the patient's allowed to expire, and then after a mandatory waiting period, the procurement process will begin. And because of this, these organs go through a different warm ischemia process um, that causes injury to the grafts and affects our outcomes. So um, to understand better about these um, organs, um, it's just throwing me off, sorry, that the you slides all cut. Right I don't know if there's, it just needs to be it's, pulled down maybe? Yeah, I'm not even sure. Um, I think it's a compatibility issue with the... Uh, I thought it'd be useful to relay a piece of my own personal oh. history. So. Yeah, um, after the very first talk I ever gave on the topic of DCD liver transplantation, my discussant was Dr. Jeremiah Turcotte. Probably most of you would know him from Child's Turcotte Fuse Score. And he came up to me after the talk and he handed me this paper that he um, had written as he put it on a similar topic. That paper was from 1966, and I thought that was about the coolest thing ever. Um, but the paper talks about a dog model that he had developed with an intraperitoneal circuit to help flush and cool the organs um, to help improve um, organ quality. And after proving that concept in a dog model, he took it to humans and he did procure two kidneys using this technique and transplanted those. And what's amazing to me about this is not that we had problems back then, but that anything worked ever. So out of those two kidneys, one of them actually worked right away and long term. And um, it did take more than an hour um, between when the patient expired to when the kidneys were flushed as we think of it. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. It's okay, yeah. we'll just, we'll make do. Um, the other kidney didn't end up working, but to be fair, it was transplanted into an individual who had a failed transplant one month prior due to AVO incompatibility, so it was likely sensitized. That was the right kidney, so short vein, two arteries, took them a much longer time to sew it in. So I think you could argue there was any number of reasons that kidney didn't work. But what we really wanna talk about is livers. So of course we gotta talk about, you can barely see them up here, but Dr. Tom Starzl, 
um, who notably did the first um, liver transplant. That first transplant was in 1963. And uh, actually, the first five transplants were with less than stellar outcomes. I think the longest survivor of those five was about 22 days. And uh, certainly, if you had outcomes like that today, CMS and UNOS would come in and shut you down. But uh, people persevered and figured out how to get better. And he had his um, first long-term success in 1967. This paper was one he published that talked about these issues they had with allograft quality, again, because the organs weren't being perfused during the time they were being procured. Um, I always thought Dr. Starzl was a very formidable and intimidating uh, early pioneer of transplant. But I have to say, this is actually a picture, now that you can see it, super great, of him presumably arm wrestling Dr. Nigerian. And in my book, I would put my money on Nigerian here. So there was a recognized need or problem that we needed better organs. And there was proof that organ transplant could save lives. So in 1968, the Harvard Committee got together. They defined brain death. They set the criteria for it. And it was actually enacted into law in 1981. I thought I probably should put a picture of some Texan president, like LBJ or someone like that. But I figured the best I could do is Ronnie Reagan, who um, was responsible for enacting this law. And I figured at least he was a Republican. Um, <laughs> So with the 80s, with the Brain Death Act, and with a lot of changes on transplant, to be fair, so cyclosporin introduced, UW Belzer solution came around, transplant just exploded. And uh, all of a sudden, centers like Pittsburgh were doing more than 600 liver transplants a year. And uh, just couldn't even keep up with the volume, it seemed like. And so TCDs kind of all but went by the wayside at that time, because there were so many available brain death donors, relatively. With time and better success, more people got on the bandwagon. And the pendulum shifted from the scarce resource being surgeons back to it being the organs themselves. And so with that, people began to start using these DCD or cardiac death donors again. Now, the early experience with this is a little bit of apples and oranges. And that's, again, the outcomes from the Pittsburgh group. But you can see here, more than half of their donors were from uncontrolled um, DCDs, which essentially is like the patient died somewhere, and we tried to get to them to procurement reasonably efficiently, as opposed to what we think of now as far as DCD donors, and those would all be controlled. In those cases, the patient is um, either in the OR or the ICU when care is withdrawn, and then if the ICU, they're quickly transported to the OR for the procurement process. Um, the first large-scale study was analysis of the UNOS registry by Dr. Peter Apt in 2003. At that time, there was 144 DCD transplants available for analysis. And while you do see that um, the rates of primary non-function and retransplant were higher, you see that this was now the minority of um, transplant outcomes. Um, and you see here the impact on graft survival was worse for DCD compared with brain death or DVD donors. And this shows patient survival, which does look worse, but this was not a statistically significant result. So the argument was for a long time that patient survival was preserved with these organs. I strongly disagreed with that uh, statement, and so we'll get to that later. But um, at any rate, this um, also shows you know, the improvement in time. So this is um, from an analysis we did. And we were looking mainly at cholangiopathy, which we'll get to, but is a very important um, consideration with these organs. This, however, is a table that looks at the primary non-function rates. And these are all the single institution studies that were available for analysis. And while technically it does show that primary non-function was higher with DCD, thus favoring DVD transplant, it was largely due to this one center here, which A, contributed a huge weight to that score, and also had a lot of these outcomes in those livers. This is, again, um, from the Pittsburgh group, kind of one of the early pioneers. And uh, in their paper, their mean cold time was 11 hours. Hopefully, by the end of the day, I'll convince you that's just too long to be suitable for these organs. So over time, there's certainly many more publications that continue to show an impact on graft survival with the utilization of these organs. Um, but then trying to understand how that impacts patient survival, it seemed to me that if you're retransplanting more patients, it's not fair to say that patient survival wouldn't be worse since we know that retransplantation is associated with mortality risk. So we decided to reanalyze the registry data. And now the UNOS experience had about 1,100 um, DCD donors available for analysis. And so we looked again at patient survival. What you can see here is that it, the curves look very similar to that earlier paper by APT, but now there's enough power to detect a statistically significant difference. 
We also wanted to understand if there may have been a learning curve and outcomes were getting better with time. So we broke it down into the early and late experience and looked at it this way. But what we found was no evidence of a learning curve in terms of patients transplanted in the later time period essentially had the same survival as patients transplanted in the early time period. So I kind of alluded to this before, but this is all related to what's been called the bugaboo of um, DCD liver transplant, which like Dr. Angel last week, I too am intrigued by words that I don't really know what they mean. So I had looked it up when I was preparing this talk, to, um, sorry, this talk, and it turns out it just means an object that we fear, and it's a hobgoblin. So uh, for DCD liver transplant, it's definitely this ischemic cholangiopathy problem. This is actually a picture from an ERCP on a patient who had ischemic cholangiopathy. And you can see this diffuse enterohepatic stricturing. And this would be a cast that was removed from their bile duct, which is like extra gross when you think about having all that debris in your biliary system. The problem with this is because it's not a focal lesion, it's not really amenable to easy, easily to intervention such as ERCP and stenting or even a surgical revision. And so often the only way to cure the patient then would be to retransplant them. <clears throat> Looking at um, how everyone was doing with this, we did this meta-analysis Looking at single institution experience, what we saw is most people had significantly higher rates of this in their DCD patients, thus favoring DVD transplant. It's associated with the overall increased odds of more than tenfold for DCD transplantation. Um, and perhaps I should point out that the reason when we talk about ischemic cholangiopathy, I will always talk about institutional studies as opposed to the UNOS data, is that this isn't an outcome that's well reported back to the registry, and that you can't look at it that way. <clears throat> so we also then looked at what was the impact of having this complication um, in terms of misery or morbidity for the patient, and we looked at resource utilization. So <laughs> take my word for it, you know, it, it does have worse graft survival and higher retransplantation. But what we also saw, not surprisingly, is that patients with ischemic cholangiopathy were readmitted more than twice as often, stayed more than twice as long, and certainly had a significantly higher number of procedures. These are all within the first year post-transplant. And uh, probably not the most shocking research I ever did, but we did look at the costs associated with this. What we did is looked at one year post-transplant institutional costs. So just looking at hospital costs, we saw that the um, cost after DCD transplantation was much higher compared with DVD. We also then looked at this again after adjusting for um, recipient possible predictors of increased costs, so older patients, higher male patients, patients who were in the ICU or in the hospital at the time of transplant. And since D DCD transplants tended to go to healthier and younger patients, we actually saw that magnified the cost difference um, once we had performed that adjustment. When you look at this um, impact on costs according to people who had the complications, you can see even more so um, this difference in cost with a 50% increased cost if you had cholangiopathy and a um, two-fold increased cost for those patients who were retransplanted. This is all within the first year. So usually, by this time in the talk, somebody out there is probably wondering, well, why would we use these livers at all then if I've hopefully convinced you that we have a lot of problems with them? And uh, this was so much better before, I swear. But uh, this schematic, um, in this schematic, it shows the entire US wait list. So each of these little guys here represents 100 people on the wait list. And this then shows how many patients actually get transplanted each year in this country. Similarly, then, this many patients are dying on the wait list while awaiting the liver. And if anything, that number is an underestimate of people who are dying due to lack of a liver, because a lot of times patients will get delisted when they become too sick for transplant. So the dilemma is and always will be, how do you help these people? And so to address this um, organ disparity, you know, in terms of number of transplants and number of patients on the wait list, people began to talk about what's called um, frackable livers. And I was really excited that I get to use this term down here. Um, but essentially, these are livers that are believed to be an underutilized source out there, meaning that there's potentially a lot more DCD donors than we're currently um, using. And so in the early 2000s, the Institute of Medicine released a report saying we should be doing more of these. And then in 2005, there was a national conference. So it was HRSA and JACO and CMS and UNOS OPTN, SRTR, AST, ASTS, all the players were there. Everybody got together and put out some benchmarks for increasing um, DCD donors. 
And you see that we d there definitely was a response to this, and this shows the percentage of liver donors from DCD donors, or sorry, percentage of liver organs. It wasn't just that people were doing more, it was that more people were doing it. So you see a f um, doubling of the number of OPOs that had DCD donors, and a fourfold increase in the number of transplant centers using these organs. So we need these livers, but they're risky livers, so the question then seemed to center around who should we be giving these risky livers to? And around that time, there was a lot of research out that um, looked at the relative benefit of getting a transplant versus your mortality risk. So Marion and the SRTR group looked at the national data, and what they showed is below a MELDA 15, your weightless mortality risks were low enough that you're actually better not getting a liver transplant because it was being balanced against the perioperative risk. And this led to the SHARE 15 rule to try and encourage transplant um, fairness around the country, but also to really direct them towards people with higher MELD scores. Now, when you look at that, this is for all livers. When you look at that according to the quality of the liver, um, they looked at according to a score called the DRI score, which is a donor risk index. It's a composite score that includes a number of donor risk factors, amongst which is DCD, but um, it also includes donor age, um, race, cause of death, and a few others. And so the higher your DRI score, the worse your liver is. And so when you're now looking at the benefit to patients of using these riskier livers, that curve shifted, and it really isn't until a meld above 20 that you saw a benefit to getting a liver versus staying on the wait list. So we looked at that, and we wanted to understand, well, okay, well, how does that pertain to specifically DCD? And we wanted to account for the problems that we knew occurred after DCD transplant, namely this ischemic cholangiopathy and all the burden and costs that were associated with it. Now, you could do a randomized controlled trial. That would be a reasonable way to look at this, but no IRB in the world is going to ever approve that study. So what we did was we constructed a decision analysis model, specifically a Markov model. But what it is is it's just a mathematical model where you look at what happens to your patient if they take the DCD transplant versus staying on the wait list and potentially getting a DVD transplant. While they're on the wait list, they have risk of mortality. Their MEL may get worse over time. After a transplant, certain complications can develop. Some of those can get better. They can go on to retransplant or they can die. And so for each of these health states, you assign the relative probabilities of these things happening and then also the cost and quality adjustments associated with these. And this is the kind of um, results you get from this kind of data. So what you see here is this is actually the effectiveness or the survival. So a positive number would be increased survival or increased quality adjusted life years. And this is the cost, um, additional cost associated with DCD transplant. So below a MELDA 15, it, DCD is both more costly and associated with a negative survival result. So you would never do this, right? That's a no-brainer. Cost more, worse outcomes. The DCD strategy was dominated. In the MELDA 15 to 20 group, what we saw is maybe there was a survival benefit here, but certainly it was such a small number that once you accounted for costs, you would never argue that this was cost effective. Whether or not cost effective is even a relevant question is a really good topic. Just sort of um, show you, I'll show you a little bit more how this works, but um, cost effectiveness really just depends on what you think is reasonable to pay. And so here you see increasing benefits in terms of survival or quality adjusted life years. And as such, these cost effectiveness ratios or the dollars per quality adjusted life year go down. And again, there's no correct number that you're getting down to. It depends on what your willingness to pay threshold is. Now, <clears throat> models are only as good as the people that made them. Since I made this model, of course it's a great one. But um, <laughs> seriously, it's, you know, when you're making these models, you have to come up with a number of assumptions. You have to populate it with all you believe is the best data about the probabilities, the utilities, and costs. And so the better the data you have in, um, go in, the better the data you have come out, but you're kind of limited by your realities. So <clears throat> in my opinion, if you're going to put much weight in this research, what you really want to look at is something like this. And this is called a Monte Carlo simulation. And what, you, what we've done here is instead of just assigning a specific value for each of the probabilities, costs and utilities, you assign the entire distribution of what you think this value may be over. And then the computer will run the model multiple times, say a thousand times, such as in this case, and each time it will randomly sample from along the distribution of each of those values, and then each dot represents a different result. 
So for patients with a MEL greater than 30, what you can see here is almost all of the model runs resulted in a positive value for the effectiveness or the quality adjusted life years. And this circle here is a 95% confidence interval. So you can be reasonably confident that according to the model, at a MELD above 30, you would get a survival benefit by taking the DCD liver. Some of these values were even below what we had defined as our willingness to pay threshold, which again may or may not be relevant to you. At a MELD 21 to 30, you see here again that most of the model results were associated with the increase in effectiveness, but you see more uncertainty, meaning more um, results that were actually negative. And then MELD 15 to 20, hopefully this demonstrates that it was really a coin flip. Half the time you got better survival, half the time you got worse. So you wouldn't look at these results and have any confidence that DCD was a better option for those patients based on these results. <clears throat> so we, what we thought was valuable was all this sort of pertains to there being a uniform probability of getting a DVD liver transplant. But that's not the reality in our country. And so in case anyone doubted the regional variation, we constructed this map based on UNOS data and this shows the 30-day probability for receiving a DVD liver if your MELD was greater than 20 according to what region you're in. So the poor folks in New York and New England have about a 10% chance in the 30 days of getting a DVD liver. Where you want to be is you want to be in the southeast U United States because there they see about a 40% chance. We're right here, obviously, and I came from region 7, so pretty similar in terms of you know, high demand, low supply, or at least relatively. And so then to understand where your patient fits on this, you look at your probability of getting a DVD transplant, and you look at along this line, this is a one-way sensitivity analysis, and say, okay, for my patient, say here, who has a 40% of getting chance of getting a DVD transplant if they're melt greater than 20, because I'm in the southeast, they're better off not getting the DCD and staying on the wait list. Um, that was sort of where we got to with this idea of who we should be giving these livers to. But the one dilemma for me was always that there was certainly still also a lot of literature around this time that was saying, well, that's great. People who have high mortality wait lists, um, sorry, wait list mortality risk are the people who are going to benefit. Well, you give a risky liver to a risky patient, you risk a bad outcome. And so there was a number of papers that showed using extended criteria or DCD donors and those patients with high MELD scores was associated with greatly increased mortality too. So it took me a while to decide how to um, reconcile these two issues and sort of led to a shift in my thinking where there wasn't just a variability in the need for DCD livers, but there also certainly was a variability in the outcomes that were being published um, in the use of these livers. And so maybe instead of spending all this time focusing on asking who should get these bad livers, maybe we should figure out how we could do better with them. So that um, is where I kind of get to this idea of using this best practices benchmarking model to kind of frame our thinking. It's a model that just helps you systematically identify and implement what are the best or better practices, meaning what are you doing? How are you doing it? How do others do it? How well are you doing in reference to them? And so how can you improve? And uh, so here's all a uh, bar graph I made. This just includes all the centers that have published their cholangiopathy rates. And I ironically have had the experience of publishing for both this end of the spectrum and this end of the spectrum, which may or may not position me to be able to talk about then what are these best or better practices. But I thought that there were several important areas to look at when you're trying to define these things. And so it would be donor selection, recipient selection, the procurement surgery, the transplant case, and then maybe some few tidbits about post-operative management. So looking at donor selection, there's a few factors that are probably important. The first one's the likelihood of progression, and this really just has to do with not all donors will die in a timely fashion with you, when you withdraw support. And if you spend a lot of time flying around to get these organs and you come home without organs, this is going to affect your center's health before too long. The Wisconsin group came up with this really fancy tool to help predict the odds of expiring um, after extubation. But if you don't like looking at something this long, especially once it's chopped up, what I would draw your attention to is right here. So most of the points in the score are assigned if you aren't breathing the vent. So if you aren't over-breathing the vent, your odds of dying when the support is taken off significantly increases, and you really can just think about that one thing and do probably about as good a job as predicting this. In terms of graph quality, there's a few things we should think about. One is the donor age. 
There's been any number of studies um, based on UNOS data that show older donors have increased risk. And this was from one of our own studies, and we looked at older donors and DCD donors and what was the combined risk. And both had higher risk compared with young DVD donors. But the one thing that is worth noting is there's no evidence of a synergy or a combined effect that was greater than the sum of its parts. So if you were used an older donor and a DCD donor, it wasn't necessarily than the risk, worse than the risk of either two by themselves. A synergy index greater than one would suggest this um, evidence of the synergy between the two factors. Either way, um, the risks are additive, even if they're not synergistic. So you have to consider this when you're deciding what organs to accept. These studies all looked at either mortality or graft failure. It was also related to um, ischemic cholangiopathy when we looked at our own experience, if you used a donor greater than 40 years old. Um, the next important factor I would point out would be donor size. And when I first started thinking about this, I just thought this was a steatosis problem, right? So if you have a fatty liver and you have a um, DCD donor, you put the two together, you have a problem. I honestly think it may just be simpler than that, that the whole point of what is important about these organs is um, time, is quickly cooling them in this case. So not only will a bigger donor be harder to get in quickly to cannulate and perfuse, but it's just harder to cool a big person down as quickly. And so there's been a number of stud studies that have suggested a link between larger donors and poorer outcomes, probably the best of which, unfortunately, is not mine, um, but it was a UNOS analysis where they looked at donors who are greater than 100 kilos, and uh, they found an increased hazards ratio for both mortality and graft loss with that group. So a lot of centers will use this as a criteria when deciding which donors to accept. Probably the most important factor in terms of donor selection is unfortunately the hardest to define, and that would be the warm ischemia time that we've talked to. And I'll skip you trying to run you through that schematic since we can't see it. But the bottom line is, is that there's been no standard definition of what the donor warm ischemia time is. So you could start that time clock at the time care is withdrawn. Some people have started measuring it when the patient becomes agonal, so an oxygenation or a blood pressure not compatible with adequate perfusion of the organs. Some people start measuring it when the donor actually expires, so asystole, or you, know, you could start that clock at incision. I, you know, I've seen anywhere from asystole to cross clamp to this whole time, and then some people even talk about warm ischemia time during the implant to further confuse the whole issue. So this has really confused the literature. It's also um, a confusing point when you're looking at UNOS data, because people are reporting it differently back to the registry. And so the bottom line is, the longer the warm time is, the worse the outcome. But what number you should use as your cutoff, I would argue that nobody can actually tell you at this time. Um, the best maybe we can do is the current AST, ASTS recommendations are that your total time should be less than 45 minutes. And then, as they called it, your true time, which is your agonal to flush time, should be less than 30 minutes. The one interesting thing about this is there's only one part of this timeline that you actually have easy control of, and that's the mandatory wait period. When I say you have control of, it's set by the donor hospital. So this is a conversation between the OPO and the donor hospitals. The transplant team really has no part in um, setting uh, donor hospital policy. But the Institute of Rec Medicine has recommended a five-minute wait period. ASTS recommended a two to five minute wait period. I was an institution where all the donor hospitals used five minutes, but there was one publication from a group that had many hospitals in their um, donor circuit, whatever, um, with the shorter time. And in their experience, they didn't think the withdrawal day systole time was different. These are patients who did not have ischemic cholangiopathy, and these were patients who were. But they did see a difference in this asystole and cross clamp time. Same group of surgeons, so essentially incision and cross clamp should not have been different between the two, but they did comment in their paper, although perhaps not in this table, that this difference in time was the two-minute hospitals versus the five-minute hospitals. So I think that's probably the most important factors for donor selection. When you think about recipient selection, there's a few things to think about. So not too shockingly, recipient age is a predictor of mortality. Um, but what I guess is interesting is not that there's been a number of studies that have showed poor outcomes in older recipients, but that there is some evidence that maybe doing DCD transplant in older patients has a synergistic effect, synergistic effect in terms of increased risk. So here is the risk in older recipients. Here is the risk of using a DCD in younger. And when you put the two together, it was greater than the sum of its parts. You can see that here by the hazard ratio is more than these two added together, and the synergy index is greater than one. 
Um, as far as other things to consider, MELD score is obviously an important one. This one became easier with shear 35, right? So below a MELD of 35, maybe worth considering these um, donors. And above 35, with any luck, your patient should get offered a quote unquote good liver or DVD liver in a timely fashion. Um, and then certainly there's been many studies that have showed an increased risk in higher MELD patients. There is at least one study, um, which is a very pro and heavy volume DCD center. And they did find good outcomes using DCD transplants in many of their patients, including their ICU patients. It's a pretty small study, so I can't argue that they've proven anything, but it is interesting. Um, the other thing that's important to consider, and this again goes back to the single most important factor about DCD transplantation, in my opinion, and that's time. So what you want to do is minimize cold time. And by, do, by that, I'm saying you should avoid anything that's going to prolong your hepatectomy. So um, not doing this in retransplantation patients is a relative contraindication. And then really, you're just trying to avoid any kind of complicated anatomy that will slow your transplant operation down. So patients with extensive portal vein and mesenteric venous thrombosis, these are probably not the best candidates for these livers. A lot of people have worried about DCD transplant for HCV patients, but the data's been back and forth. And so there essentially were um, studies on both sides. Here's a UNO study that showed that the rates of graft failure were higher in their HCV patients. There was another UNO study that showed no interaction between HCV and DCD. You can see that in these Kaplan-Meier curves here. Um, there was an institutional experience, a pretty small experience. They sh showed that DCD into HCV was far worse than um, DCD into non-HCV. They saw higher rates of histologic recurrence and more severe HCV. This was about 15 and 17 patients in 42, so pretty small experience. A bigger study that um, is not humongous, but certainly much larger based on a matched cohort, didn't show any differences in um, these three groups. And they did have protocol biopsies to look at, which they did and commented that they didn't see any difference in the fibrosis progression um, in terms of the HCV recurrence and between the DCD and the DVD patients. And this, of course, will all be changing with our new meds, but um, there's not really strong data to suggest avoiding DCD for HCV at this time anyways. Um, not a really well talked about area, but an area that became interesting to me was the use of these uh, organs in PSC patients. So my own most recent experience analyzing DCD data um, based on single institution data, almost all of the cholangio cholangiopathy outcomes were in PSC patients, about three quarters of them. Now, you can have recurrent PSC, or you can have DCD or graft-related ischemic cholangiopathy. They look the same on ERCP, so most people will define one versus the other by the timeline. You pick a cutoff, early outcomes blamed on the graft, later outcomes blamed on the patient. Um, we chose six months in our timeline, but um, as far as other literature on this topic, there really hasn't been any reported literature suggesting or proving that you shouldn't be using DCD livers in PSC patients. Some have suggested avoiding them. There is some non-DCD transplant literature that have shown a relationship between PSC and these non-anastomotic ischemic type strictures, um, probably the largest of which is the Netherlands data. And they've published on this several times. But um, they had shown this link between um, cholangiopathy and PSC People have also commented on that it may just be based on their anatomy. So most PSC patients will get a rue reconstruction, meaning their entire native bile duct would be removed um, because it's diseased. And some people thought that it was the rue anatomy that was causing the problem and that um, bile and bacteria could reflux up into the biliary tree and cause this process. At least in their study, it wasn't relevant what kind of anatomy you had because they didn't believe that. So many of their PSC patients would get duct-to-duct -duct, um, reconstruction. Um, but what was the problem was whether or not they had PSC, meaning about a 30% risk. This is non-anastomotic strictures, same as ischemic cholangiopathy, versus 15% risk in the non-PSC patients. When we were looking at our own data, we saw that our patients with ischemic cholangiopathy did receive older livers, and there was a trend towards um, a longer death intervals. Um, what we called it, this would be withdrawal to asystole. Um, but what we saw, as I had already alluded to, was really most of these events were occurring in our PSC patients. They also happen to be our cholangiocarcinoma patients, which we'll get to in a minute, um, and that most of these were patients with a RULIM. 
So to try and parse out which is which, we had seven patients with cholangiopathy, so 70% were um, PSC patients or cholangiocarcinoma patients. They were also um, RU patients. There was two in the group that were HCV and they happened to have duct to duct. If you look at all the PSC patients as a group that got DCDs, 80% had a roof reconstruction, and in 20%, we actually did duct to duodenum rather than a root limb. And there was no cholangiopathy for whatever it was worth in the duct to duodenum group. If you looked according to the biliary anatomy for the DCD patients, if you had a roux, there was 33% that developed cholangiopathy versus 6% in the duct to duct and 0% of the duct to duodenum. In that experience, if you got cholangiopathy, it had a huge impact on survival. You know, 50% of these patients were dead um, essentially here within three years. Whether this is a failure to retransplant or just the huge morbidity associated with this problem, this was definitely statistically different and clinically different. And so the reason I kind of pointed out the cholangiocarcinoma thing is it occurred to me, well, maybe these are just our cholangio patients. It's not unreasonable to expect they might have higher mortality. But when you look at the different groups, again, more than half the ischemic cholangiopathy patients died. It's actually only about 30% of the PSC patients or cholangiocarcinoma patients had died. So it seemed to be more the development of this complication than their disease that they started with. Uh, the one other thing to mention is that the cholangiocarcinoma patients would have all got the neoadjuvant um, Mayo protocol for um, cholangiocarcinoma, and so they all got um, radiation to that area pre-transplant, not post. So thinking about the procurement, there's not a lot of empiric evidence on this, but thinking about what may be the important factors, there is um, looking across institutions maybe a bias towards an attending consultant surgeon doing the donation um, surgery being better than a fellow. I, I, and I hate to say that since I just finished my fellowship, but at the end of the day, what you need is an experienced surgeon who can do the case quickly. As such, you would prefer OR withdrawal to avoid any delays in terms of getting to the patient to the OR in a timely fashion. Heparin should be given prior to withdrawal in terms of achieving the best outcomes, and that's in line with the ASTS RACs. You'll occasionally find donor hospitals have rules against this because they worry that that heparin could uh, lead to the death of the donor. And so in those hospitals that won't allow it, the best you can do is just put it in the initial flush. You just have to remember to do this. It's important. Um, some, really, I, I only know of one center um, that was routinely still using pre-mortem femoral cannulation in recent years. And uh, there's no real evidence of benefit. In fact, they're on that bar graph. They're one of the centers that have the higher um, rates of cholangiopathy. So there's no evidence that this works in terms of improving uh, flushing or graph quality of the organ. You need a fast incision aortic cannulation time. And the data I just showed you, the institutional data, 65% of those had an incision to cannulation time of less than two minutes. So fast is good. Um, the other thing you have to remember to do is vent early. You don't want to let the liver get engorged. Um, some people do a portal vein versus um, IMV cannulation. Most people do do a portal flush as well as aortic. Um, I don't think it matters which. And then you probably should clamp the aorta somewhere. It's really more important that you're flushing the organs and venting the organs, but if you figure out somewhere to clamp the aorta quickly, then you save a lot of your solution going up into the chest. Ice is important, and biliary flushing early is important. It's not exactly well proven in the science yet, but most people believe that the biliary stasis in the, tr in the um, biliary tree during the procurement process leads to injury of those epithelial cells and is related to this problem post transplant. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I would usually just in, cut open the gallbladder, stick an acepto in the gallbladder, and flush it with saline after you divided the bile duct. So as soon as you get your vascular flushes going in a DCD case, you're going to do that. In a DVD where you're controlled and you have more time, you can do that long before you even um, no flush. Some so the Osh, the guy from Oshner, Dr. Loss, flushes the biliary tree whenever he looks at it, right? So he does it in the body, he does it on the back table, he does it during the recipient operation. Every time he looks at the bile duct, he tries to flush it. Um, but as far as like a pulse, or sorry, a pressure perfusion or something fancy like that, I've seen a lot of talk of that with respect to the hepatic artery, not so much with the biliary tree. Um, and we'll allude to the artery options in just a second, but there's no good science behind any of those. 
Um, as far as flush solution, there are a few papers that are important to consider. So somewhere along the way, someone said, well, HTK has got to be better because it's a low viscosity solution compared with UW. It also instantly is cheaper. Some people like that. Um, there was a big study from the Indiana group that said it was better. Um, this, to me, is not the best study, though. So this grouped all ECD livers um, together, so old donors, fatty donors, and DCD donors, and actually only a minority of them were from DCDs. And when they compared outcomes, their UW group was historical. So they basically did a bunch of procurements with UW, switched over to HTK, and then compared the later experience to the earlier experience. And when you look at differences between the early and late, they had a lot longer cold times in that historical cohort, too. So what they commented on is that there was less biliary strict sharing in the HTK group, but this result wasn't significant. And then ironically, they didn't comment on the fact that their graft survival was lower, as that was also not significant. Um, to me, this was a better study. This is just my opinion, I guess. Um, this was the UNOS registry analysis. They looked at, <clears throat> this group actually looked at HTK versus UW outcomes for all sorts of transplant. But in their paper on li liver transplant, um, what they found was higher risk or higher hazard ratio for patient survival in the HTK, I'm sorry, HTK group. And they also repeated that analysis, not just adjusting for patient factors, but also adjusting for center and found that that remained a significant factor. So arguably, of the little research that's been done, UW is better for DCD livers than HTK. Not everybody's going to agree with you on that. That's just what we have so far. Um, and then people have tried any number of things. And this kind of gets to what you were asking about, but this is all related to the artery. So some people have tried using TPA in the artery, either during the donor surgery or the procurement surgery or on the back table. Um, there's not a lot of good evidence. Probably the best study um, didn't show that it was necessarily helpful. And they did see higher um, take backs in their transplant, um, transplant patients because of post-op bleeding. Um, some people have tried using fentolamine, which is an alpha blocker, to kind of open up the microvasculature and protect the liver. Um, but there's not been any real clear evidence come out of that. Some people are using uh, pressure perfusion on the back table. Uh, there was one study that said it was better. They had some significant other differences in their cohorts, though, such as donor age. Um, sorry, this is, uh, you know, I think just a handbag kind of pressure perfusion. And then some people have tried machine pulsatile perfusion, which we use a lot in kidneys, especially DCD kidneys, to reduce rates of DGF. But as far as the impact on livers, there's really no evidence of benefit as yet. Um, as far as the transplant, there's a few things to consider. And we've kind of already alluded to some of these. One is it's important to keep your cold time short. So one, it, one way to do that is you avoid the complicated patient. That's the redo patient. That's the complicated mesenteric venous um, thrombosis patient. The other is you coordinate your teams. And so um, centers that tend to have better outcomes, if I can say that, um, will often start the recipient surgery before the donor's back. So one team's getting the liver, the other team's already starting the case. That, again, then probably requires sending a more experienced surgeon out on the donation, because you need to be able to trust that person when they say the liver's good. And I'll tell you, when I was a brand new fellow, I started doing procurement. My comment was usually like, I think the liver's good. It looks OK. And it just takes a certain amount of experience before you get more comfortable making that call. Uh, we talked about this limiting implant time. Um, in my past, um, my most recent experience, we put biliary tubes in everybody all the time, including our DCD transplants. We loved it because we could shoot all these cholangiograms. That way, radiology could drive us crazy anytime we had a size mismatch. But we felt at least that it helped us with early diagnosis. Um, and certainly, it decreased our use of ERCPs for all the people who end up having negative cholangiograms and you're wondering why their transaminases are up. This was kind of an easy way to quickly evaluate their biliary tree. Um, there is some research about simultaneous revascularization on the artery and the vein versus portal vein only. There was one study, um, well, I don't know where it went. Um, <laughs> maybe it'll come back to me. But uh, this just shows here that the longer your um, cold time, the worse your outcomes. I would argue that you really want to keep your cold time below eight hours, for sure. Below six hours is great. And the st study I showed you earlier um, with the only 13% rate of cholangiopathy, the average cold time was four hours. Um, getting back to the simultaneous revascularization, um, there was one study that looked at this. And they saw very low rates if both um, vessels were reperfused on. 
versus a little bit higher if you were only reperfusing on the portal vein. Um, I didn't put it here, but I'm pretty sure the p-value wasn't significant. And then I don't really know of any good research on this topic, but it's something that's been talked about. Some people think you should actually use induction in these patients. And the thought process is that thymol will decrease ischemia reperfusion injury by blocking um, some of the T-cell and cytokine-related um, reactions to ischemia reperfusion. Um, there has been studies that show it decreases the transaminases or the bilirubin. Uh, there is no study I know of that showed it affect, affected outcomes in a positive way, um, but there were historical associations between developing acute rejection and developing cholangiopathy. Um, you do have to balance this against the risk of using induction in a group of patients you probably wouldn't otherwise be using induction for, and that is that PTLD um, does occur in some of our liver patients. There are two interesting areas to me in terms of the post-operative management. One is the use of mucomist. Um, there, are stud there are centers that use this routinely in their extended criteria donors, whether that's old fat or DCD. As far as the literature goes, um, you know, the mechanism would be, again, to reduce ischemia reperfusion injury. There were some promising animal studies on the topic, um, showed improved bile output, decreased transaminases. Um, I believe this is one of those studies here. Um, and then there's been a number of studies in humans, and they show various things. So, so you can see here maybe the PT and the bile production were better. Um, but at the end of the day, none of these studies did definitively show a difference in what's considered a clinically important outcome, such as patient graft survival or length of stay, that kind of thing. That said, if you were deciding to use it, mucomist is certainly cheaper than many of the medications we use in transplant, and there aren't too many harmful side effects um, that have been associated with it, so I think it's a very reasonable consideration. Uh, as far as CMV prophylaxis, there's been an association between post-op CMV infection and cholangiopathy. I have no idea if this is the chicken or the egg. I don't know if getting CMV is causing the cholangiopathy or patients with cholangiopathy have higher risks of CMV reactivation and infection. Uh, but there is certainly an association. You can see here a higher risk. Um, this is patients with ischemic cholangiopathy, patients without. And there was higher rates of CMV infection and those patients had cholangiopathy. It's statistically significant. This is, again, the Netherlands group. The rate of DCD transplant in the Netherlands is about 90%. So they use a lot of these organs relatively. Um, but so I would say at least giving consideration to six months prophylaxis after DCD transplantation would be very reasonable. So in terms of using the findings, we talked about donor selection. So um, best predictor of whether or not it's worthwhile to go look at the organs is overbreathing. If they're overbreathing, it's probably it's at least much more likely they may not progress and you may be wasting your time. It's hard to say what the appropriate cutoff is, but as the age of the donor goes up, you are increasing your risk. Some people would use 40. Some, um, I was used to using 55 most recently. Uh, most people won't use donors over 100 kilos. Who knows what the right warm time cutoff is, but longer warm time should make you very nervous. <clears throat> as far as recipient selection, should give it to younger donors, arguably. Uh, certainly with Sugar 35, I can't make a strong argument, like I did with my model, <laughs> that you should be giving these to high meld patients. Um, you want to give these to easy to transplant patients. I don't think there's any evidence that it's wrong to give it to HCV patients, but I would consider maybe not using them for PSC patients. We talked about the procurement. You want, you want people to be fast. You want an experienced surgeon. You already want the heparin in. You want a really rapid recovery. And then you have to consider that these are probably the two most important things, and that's flushing the artery and the biliary system quickly. It's somewhat anecdotal, not totally evidence-based as far as the biliary comment. <laughs> and then transplant. Again, limit your time. So goal should be less than eight hours. I'd say less than six hours. To do that, you've got to coordinate things. You should consider simultaneous revascularization, biliary tubes if you're not against it. And I don't know, maybe think about thymo. And we already just talked about these. So if you want to remember one thing, if you want to do DCD liver transplantation and with you know, successful outcomes, what you got to think about is time. You got to keep the time short. So keep the donor time short, keep the cold time short, keep the recipient time short, and then if anything else, the time the donor spent on the earth. So, and I'm happy to take any questions. Describe the Mayo's um, <coughs> 
So um, we would put it in through the d donor gallbladder. So we remove the donor gallbladder. So in through the cystic duct and just secure it there. We'd secure it with a Vicryl stitch and a hemorrhoid band. So we actually just pulled it out at the bedside 21 days later. Um, you try and put the, your tube across your anastomosis that lets you shoot a cholangiogram. Mm -hmm. Five French, five French biliary um, tube, or sorry, pediatric feeding tube. Um, we would do a post-op day seven cholangiogram and a post-op day 21 if those. Guys stack vials post-op? Stack what? <laughs> Every day take a sample of vial. No. Put in a... No, we just took pictures. And, you know, a lot of times these ducts aren't the same size. So the first important thing to get comfortable with is radiology will frequently read a stricture because you got a little donor duct, you got a big recipient duct, and there's going to be a transition point. The main thing was to look for a leak. And then um, it also let you see the intrahepatic biliary tree and what's going on there. And then if you had clinical evidence of a biliary obstruction and it looked like you had a stricture, then maybe you'd start to listen to radiology. We didn't either by the bedsides, the Mayo Clinic, sir. <laughs> I joke, but they, they went to radiology for both. And uh, so no, no complications, no... From the biliary tubes themselves? Yeah, pulling them out at day 21. Very rare. And um, I, I can't say that there wasn't a bile leak ever blamed on um, the cystic duct leaking after the tubes were removed, but with the delayed removal of them, that was... I didn't personally see it. I've heard people complain about it. So. Just about. I mean, you had to have a donor gallbladder or at least be able to identify the donor cystic duct, which you pretty much can't do if they've already had their gallbladder removed. And then if they didn't, um, sometimes we'd put it through the recipient cystic duct. So we do our anastomosis above that level, put it through recipient cystic duct. Your tube isn't across your anastomosis that way, but you can reflex the um, dye up into the biliary tree and you can still see stuff. So. No, they had this little jibber jab that they do with the ruse most of the time. So if it was a living donor, not so much. Those just got stents. But in a deceased, I don't know why it's different, but in a deceased donor um, rue limb, we'd like whistle a different kind of tube up their rue limb and into their um, anastomosis, across their anastomosis. Although we were more likely to get frustrated and not always do that. I don't know what that means. He just wants to sound smarter than me. <laughs> do anybody have any other questions? I have a tendency of talking too fast, so. Right. So I didn't show it in my Markov model, but we did do a look at the HCC patients. And what we looked at is HCC with exceptions and HCC that weren't T1s without exceptions, so more beyond Milan. And the HCCs without did well getting a transplant. The HCCs with were better staying on the list and getting a DVD because they had good odds of getting a DVD. Part of the reason I don't include that is I was always not totally comfortable with our HCC results from that model because HCV, sorry, HCC management pre-op is so different from center to center. So I've worked at Therosphere centers, I've worked at taste centers, and how those patients are managed is wildly different. So then when you're trying to say, well, what are their risks and what are their costs and all those things at a national level, it's just a hodgepodge of data. So, but in general, HCC exceptions, wait for a good liver, but patients with bad HCC who aren't qualifying for exceptions maybe consider if you think they'll benefit from transplant at all. Um, totally aside from the liver, some of this extrapolates, I'm assuming, to kidney? So I, I have not personally done any research about DCD kidney transplant. Um, you know, the teaching I always had is that you have higher rates of delayed graft function, um, but long-term results are as good. I think they're as close to as good, and the nephrologists can correct me if they 
wrong, but it's more a short-term phenomenon that we see as the problem with DCD. And certainly a lot of places will pump those. And uh, whether that's the pumping is therapeutic in terms of breaking the vasospasm or diagnostic in that if the numbers don't get better, you don't use them. I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. So the very first experience I had with this was a high volume center who had high rates of cholangiopathy. And I don't think it was affecting their CMS bottom line because it is risk adjusted for. Whether or not it's enough risk adjusted for is a good question. But one of the concerns was that um, it wasn't getting adequately reimbursed for because, and that was why we partially, at least partially why we looked at our costs was it certainly was costing us more and it gets reimbursed the same. Um, if you're really savvy, and you can do DCD liver transplant well, then you should do a lot of them, right? Because then your risk adjustment goes down, your outcomes are good, you're protecting your ODE ratios and your stance with the CMS. And I will say, I spent a short amount of time at one center that was exactly their strategy. And I think that DCD is one of those things that the more you do, the more comfort you have with it, and the more comfort you have with it, the more potential you have for success if you've identified what's important and you're doing that. So it can be advantageous, but you just, you have to have out good outcomes then. Okay. Thank you.